All right, so we are back, and I wanted to cover a little bit of an intro to understanding cameras, or I should say understanding lenses for cameras. And I want to start to let you understand the difference between real-world lenses and the lenses used inside computer programs such as Nuke and Maya. Um, we're going to talk about artifacts. We have to know cameras. One of the things I do when I teach my classes in compositing is I spend some time with cameras. I let the students actually physically go out, shoot some plate shots and so forth. And I, I once had a um, instructor or uh, my boss at uh, Columbia where I used to teach and he used to kind of like bark at me and say, why are you showing them cameras? You should show them compositing. You know, I was like, I'm only got a couple classes here with it. And I kind of just explained to him the reality that they really need to know what it is they're trying to replicate. As compositors, you know, you're replicating the imperfect world in the perfect world of a computer. Um, a lot of the artifacts seen in anything from, you know, lens flares and so forth, these are sort of imperfections, so to speak, and we try to create those or trick the audience, being we the tricksters, the VFX people, into believing what they see was actually photographed through a physical lens. Remember, you are not recreating real life through the eye of a human eye. You are recreating uh, reality through, or CG, through the photographic look of a lens that's being captured onto a sensor, in our case, because we're all shooting digital these days. So it's important to understand what artifacts we're going to try to replicate. Uh, computers don't really deal with uh, imperfections, or at least, you know, rendering programs and so forth. You have to kind of create those and emulate those. So the first one, of course, is depth of field. So that's right here. And it's really based on your aperture size. Uh, usually if you have a, in an open, F, you know, if your f-stop is like 2.0 or, you know, one of these crazy ones, it's like 0.98 or whatever, you can get a heavy bokeh. And you can see right here, it's like these little uh, shapes uh, based on the blades of your iris and so forth. Um, and in the midst of that, you get areas in focus and out of focus. Uh, usually you're opening up your lenses, uh, or I'm sure you're opening up your aperture because you're losing light or you're in a low light situation. That's why you commonly see this reality, uh, whenever you're actually filming, uh, at nighttime. Now you can get the same effect in daytime, but you have to use a lot of ND filters, which cut down the light, which allow you to take your aperture and open it up real wide, which gives you that photographic effect where you're concentrating on the foreground element and blurring out any traffic in the background because you're concentrating on your character in the foreground. And it also has a nice dreamy, creamy look, they commonly call it. Uh, very cinematic look. Okay, so that's depth of field. Uh, motion blur obviously has to do with the, you know, the shutter itself, uh, you know, allowing for long or um, exposures as each frame is exposed. If you take your a camera and open up for the exposure and you take your uh, camera and whip it over with a whip pan, uh, you're going to be getting a streaked image. And that's really what motion blur is all about. Rolling shutter is an uh, artifact that hopefully will go away very soon. It's uh, from CMOS chips, very cheap cameras, uh, usually all of the DSLRs nowadays. Uh, Blackmagic has a uh, global shutter, which captures a full frame. And the way that works is it kind of starts from the top to bottom and scans the image, like top to bottom, top to bottom. So by the time that the image is recorded at the bottom of the frame, it's actually the, 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 the information beforehand is like living in the past. So if your camera's panning from left to right, you're going to get this skewed artifact, as you can see here. This is very bad for any tracking inside of Nuke because you're introducing an artifact the computer can't figure out. It kind of doesn't understand rolling shutter. Um, it just assumes the footage you're giving it doesn't have any weird artifact. It's like basically taking your footage and putting it through uh, a sort of a prism of a jello mold or something and, and wobbling the jello. And it's like going, I don't know what to do with this. So commonly you can fix that with some filters to get it back to a vertical skew, um, different ways of kind of doing that, or you just got to shoot conservatively and just make sure your camera's not moving around a lot. Now, different cameras have different amounts of rolling shutter. Uh, red is very, very, there's very little of it, uh, but cameras such as the A6300 or the A7S, those cameras have heavy, heavy, heavy rolling shutter. And you can also see whenever someone does flash photography, you'll see uh, commonly up here you'll see like a white bar or down here you'll see a white bar and that's just the exposure happening at a different time. It's really annoying and it's really a nightmare when you're dealing with tracking, 3D tracking specifically. Um, lens flares 
Um, usually you over, uh, the overexposure, I forgot how many f-stops it is, um, but you just, basically anything looking into the camera, you overexpose into the elements inside the camera, uh, and you get these interesting shapes and so forth, and this is commonly called a glint, this is a little bit of a glow, and, and also, uh, it just to kind of give that realism, if you have dirt on your lens, you can kind of, you know, simulate that, uh, we've done that before in, uh, different projects. Chromatic aberration is one people barely even touch upon, and usually it comes with, um, it's a very subtle effect, and it usually comes with cheap lenses. Very open apertures on cheap lenses, basically, is the combo, and it's mostly on the outside of the frame. You can see here, it's fine. You get these weird fringes, purple or green, sort of like orange or blue, and you can see what's going on here as far as the actual focus position and, and how it gets weird along the edges. And again, this the, this, the, the better the lens quality, um, the, the ground to glass quality, uh, the better off you will not have these artifacts. And that's where money comes in. Silhouette is the lack of light. Outside edges um, usually are darker um, due to uh, very low light situations. But you got to remember, you're, you're shooting through a barrel, right? A circular lens. And that light is really coming in at the center, but it's losing itself along these edges and you get these sort of darkened areas. Now, usually, again, this is when you have a low-light situation, so it's not all the time, obviously. So, good news is we're starting to get cameras that are really good at kind of dealing with that sort of artifact. The other thing I want to talk about is the real-life lens distortion artifacts. Um, the reason why I kind of press real life is there's a difference between the camera inside of the computer, such as Maya or Nuke, and then the camera that's in the real world. The real world has what's called bowed lens distortion. Both, both uh, the real world camera and the computer camera have lens distortion, but they one has bowed and one doesn't. So one thing to realize also, if you're not much of a photographer, is the millimeter lens, or how wide angle the lens is, or the field of view, as it goes up, the, you know, obviously you start to see distortion kind of flattening out. So heavy distortion, Right, and then as we get to longer and longer and longer lenses, a flatter image, you get to a point where you're about a 135, and there's not much of a difference between these images, as you can see here. So usually people like Terry Gilliam is a filmmaker. Whenever he has a scene where it's a, you know, whether he's in a mental institution or people are supposed to be crazy, and the whole scene's supposed to be very crazy, he'll throw on a wide-angle lens and get right up to the actor. And it gives this really weird look. The Coen brothers usually like to use lenses like 35 millimeter to give that sort of uh, slightly comical, but you're there experience. So again, it all it's, it all depends what it is. But the more the wi more uh, wide angle your lens is, the more you're going to get into this barrel distortion. And it's actually you can see here in the actual shape. And this is not in the computer uh, cameras. Is you get this bow. See the bow here? And it's extremely uh, heavy along the edges of the frame and not at the center. Well, why is that? Well, look at this lens from the side. The images coming in are flat. This is the flattest part here of the lens. But here you're getting a heavy curvature, right? And because of that, you're going to get more distortion along the edges. We have to take out barrel distortion when we work inside of Nuke to do tracking or it's going to give us artifacts. So just realize that you're always going to have lens distortion, but you have to remove barrel distortion, okay? Because you're taking the imperfect camera and bringing it into the perfect computer lens, which actually has just straight perspective lines. And I'm going to show you that in Maya in a minute. Uh, and then as you get further, you start to get into this pin cushion distortion effect. Um, you know, here and there, just kind of realize that. But the big thing I want you to take away from this is real life lenses have bowed lens distortion. Computer lenses do not, and that's where we what's quote unquote undistorting the plate is commonly what we do. So here we are inside of Maya. Maya is a 3D application. This is very similar though if you were into Nuke as well. I have a series of squares in the scene, and I want you to pay attention to something that's interesting. I currently have my focal length set to 16 millimeter, and you can kind of take a look at it as I kind of move around. It has that clowny look. I can exaggerate this even more by putting this to maybe 10 millimeter. You can see that we have heavy lens distortion on the outside edges of the frame, and we don't have hardly any lens distortion in the center of the frame. So you can see the center of the frame looks fine. These, this cube looks, you know, this edge is almost, you know, uh, 
roughly, you know, about the distance of this line. You know, it feels very square, whereas these start to feel like rectangles. Look at that guy. I mean, that looks like a rectangle. And there's a distortion there. And commonly when people get into 2D tracking, planar tracking, and 3D tracking, they start to work and they go, why is my... I'm trying to track in this, you know, sign that I want to put on top of this, you know, sign that's in the scene, and I'm getting this weird drift. And that has to do with lens distortion issues uh, actually throwing things off. So there's different ways of kind of combating that as we'll get into it. But realize at 16 millimeter, we're getting some heavy distortion where the center of the frame doesn't change much. In fact, let me go ahead and just do a quick pan here. I want to show you what I mean. I'm going to go ahead and angle out this center cube here. And I'm going to go ahead and just do a... Uh, fly tool, which is a panning. And you can see as I get to the edge of the frame, this, this, this object looks absolutely insane. But as I get to the center of the frame, it starts to normalize into a perfect uh, cube. See that? The one thing to take away from this is that we have no barrel lens distortion in here. So you can see here, this here is uh, basically straight perspective lines. Now, if we start changing the millimeter lens, so if I switch this from 10 millimeter to say 35 millimeter, we start to get less distortion. Everything is, even along the edges, these are starting to look very similar, right? There's, they're, they're not heavy distorted. This is no longer a rectangle. If I take a look up here, they're very, very similar. And then you get to a kind of a hit point of uh, focal length uh, or field of view, quote unquote, where if you go to like say well, let's go 90 millimeters, usually 50 millimeters, when it starts to get flat, you can see everything is just nice and flat. There's less distortion. Uh, there is still distortion. Be be not deceived, uh, but it is very very flat. And basically the reason being is we're 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 zooming in. Okay, as you increase focal length, you're technically quote unquote zooming. And as you zoom, the field of view actually changes more narrower. And by doing that, you're actually concentrating on the center of the lens uh, itself, which means there's less lens distortion, right? Because it's the actual glass itself that's curved. But as you move to the center of the lens via zooming or just a longer lens, you'll find that things will look a lot flatter and you'll have less issues in, in regards to lens distortion. In the same way here, I'm going to go ahead and do the fly tool again, which is basically a panning of the camera. And you can see I'm not seeing any distortion, hardly any, so to speak. But as you continue to increase this focal length to something, say, oh, I don't know, 200 millimeter or whatever, you start to get a, a touch of a pin cushion effect, okay? It's not very present, but sometimes it is um, as you kind of move through it. So it's a hit or miss. And you also have to, you also have to realize something, and that is that every lens is imperfect, okay? The computer lens is perfect. This is a perfect lens, by the way. So if I move around in it. But every lens is different. And that's why we usually shoot um, graphs or grids for our each lenses. Uh, when we worked on Thrill Ride, which is a feature film that is currently in post-production or uh, we're approaching distribution, I was the VFX supervisor. We took every camera lens they had. They had a series of primes and one zoom. And we made sure that they always shot... Uh, a, a basic uh, checkerboard, black and white checkerboard uh, for each lens so that we had a mapping. And inside of Nuke, you can actually take that and undistort the plates. So I just want to let you guys know that as we start to walk into the realm of tracking, why everything is and, and, and just different artifacts that come into this. But keep in the back of your mind that you are trying to recreate reality through the eye of a film lens, an imperfect film lens through trickery in the perfect world of the computer.